So hi, everybody. Welcome. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Um, so uh, e even with that lovely introduction about squeeze light and optical cooling, today I'm going to tell you about something that's even cooler. And that's uh, the detection uh, of gravitational waves. Now, I want to start off by just having you pay a little attention to this title slide, because there's a lot of important information uh, in there. So the first thing that I want you to notice is the number 100 years. So we're exploring the warped universe. So we're going to go on a journey today that takes us to those parts of the universe that are inherently dark. We can't see light from them and also very warped and actually quite violent. So if you're a little queasy with those things, you might want to leave. All right. Now, uh, the other thing I want you to notice is it's a 100-year journey. So that's going to be a little bit of a journey with, uh, to do that. All of the things I'm going to talk to you about, which was the detection of gravitational waves with these detectors that we call LIGO, which is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, uh, was done in a big collaboration. So I'm just the messenger. This was the LIGO and Virgo collaborations of uh, many hundred scientists. And finally, I also want to point out that a small little round logo on, uh, on, on, on the bottom right is the National Science Foundation. They funded this whole thing over many decades. So this is also a story in public funding. But now let me go, step back to the fun part. And that is to tell you that on the front pages of virtually every newspaper in any language that you would you choose in any country, the headlines on February 12th, 2016 was about the first direct detection of gravitational waves. And so today what I want to do is I want to take those headline stories and unpack them a little. What was the story behind the headlines and what did we really do? Okay, so the First thing that I want to do is step back a little bit and ask how do we know about most of the things in the universe? When we look out into the sky, what do we see? Well, it started with the ancients. We looked at things with our naked eyes. And then we got better at building instruments. And eventually, we got so good at that that we could look at some of the most spectacular uh, objects in the universe. And here is an example. This is a supernova remnant. And this is one of my most favorite pictures in astronomy, maybe my second most favorite after the detection of gravitational waves now. Yeah. But what this picture shows is it's actually a composite made up of three different wavelengths of light. This is an object called Cassiopeia A. It is what's left over after, uh, several hundred years after a star died. So a star very much like our own sun exploded. And why did it explode? Because it ran out of nuclear fuel, and so it kind of got crunched under its own self-gravity. And as this process happened, it threw off a bit of material, and that's all the gas and dust you see in different colors. And those different colors are different wavelengths of light. The reddish colors are infrared light, so that's the color of light that our own eyes can't see. Snake eyes can, but ours can't. Then the green yellows are optical, which is what our eyes uh, see. And then the blue colors are actually X-ray, so very energetic photons. And what you see is that as these ejecta of gas and dust were blown off by the star, the blues went out the farthest because they're the most energetic. Okay? Now, if you pay very close attention, at the very center of this object, you'll see a small blue dot. Does everybody see it? Yes. What is that? It's blue because it only shows up when you look at this object with an X-ray telescope, Cassiopeia A. It is a new star, a kind of star called a neutron star, and it is the star that's born when this parent star that was like our own sun died. And this neutron star is kind of remarkable. It has about the mass of our sun, but it has a radius that's 10 kilometers, so it's actually about the size of, of the width of Manhattan. Okay, so imagine that, our own sun, its radius, 700,000 kilometers. This object, same mass, 10 kilometers. So it has a lot of gravity in it. And that's my point. When stars like our own sun die, they produce these very dense, compact stars called neutron stars. Now, if this parent star that exploded had been heavier, if it had been three to 10 times the mass of our sun, then instead of a, a neutron star, its gravity would have been so much larger that it would have kept shrinking until it became a black hole. And that's how black holes are born. They're actually born out of stars like our own. Star dies. If it's light, it forms a neutron star. If it's a bit heavier, it forms a cousin, which is a black hole. And so that's the process that we see when we look out in the sky with different colors of light. Now, this black hole 
this is actually not a real picture. The first one's a real picture taken with telescopes. This one is actually an artist's rendition of a black hole. And in this picture, what you see is all this swirl of gas and dust as it's orbiting the black hole. And of course, the stuff that gets too close to the black hole will get sucked in, but there's a whole bunch of stuff around the black hole that's just being swirled around as the black hole spins. And this is the way that we collect evidence for black holes until recently. We look out into the sky, we look for objects like this where the gas and dust around the black hole starts glowing, and usually in the X-ray. You can even see this gas and dust flickering, and the frequency at which it flickers tells you the frequency at which the black hole is spinning around its axis. So that's another thing we learn about black holes. They can spin. But until recently, we have not been able to answer the question of what do black holes really look like? How might we observe them? Because intrinsically, unless they're surrounded by gas and dust, which some are, they're invisible to light. Light doesn't escape a black hole. That's its definition. It's a star that's so, that has so much gravity packed into such a small volume that even light can't escape, right? So this brings me to a new type of messenger, a gravitational wave. And that's gravity's messenger. So if we want to understand what a gravitational wave is, we should really think about what gravity is. And the first person who really gave serious thought to gravity and formed a very uh, fine theory of it was Isaac Newton. And so in the 17th century, Isaac Newton had this fantastically successful universal law of gravitation. It was called universal because it could explain why apples fell from trees, but it could also explain why moons orbited planets and perhaps, and eventually why the planets orbit the sun. And it's actually quite simple. If you look at the equation that Newton coined, it, it says there's a force. If you have two masses, and they have a mass m1 and m2, so two masses, and they're separated by some distance r, then they feel a gravitational force mutually, and that force is proportional to their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance. We all learned this in our early, early physics classes, and it's a beautiful theory. Now, Newton himself worried about something. He worried about this idea of action at a distance. What's that? Well, how can this mass here and this mass there know about each other? What is the, 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 the way that information is ex exchanged between them? And that never got solved in, in Newton's time, and in fact, didn't get solved until uh, several hundred years later, 300 years later, uh, uh, more or less, and that was with the work of our next great hero of gravity, and that's Albert Einstein. Now, Einstein was pretty radical when it came to gravity. He, he kind of told us to throw out the idea of force. Gravity is not a force, Einstein said to us. Gravity is geometry. What does that mean? Well, so Einstein's version of gravity is that when you have some massive object sitting out in empty space, that massive object will warp that region of empty space, very much like if you put a bowling ball in the center of a cushion. The bowling ball will curve the, the, the cushion, and if you put a playing marble at the edge of the cushion, the marble must fall into the bowling ball. That was the way he described gravity, its curvature of space-time. And in fact, he actually also was also able to codify it in a, in a very beautiful uh, equation, and that's this equation that relates on the one side, how, how um, uh, energy is, is contained in a system, and on the other side, how uh, geometry is contained in the system. So this equation, it looks really lovely and sweet, but it is actually really a horrendously difficult equation to solve. And in fact, it has taken almost a century to get even the first sort of handles on exact solutions of this equation uh, in the case of black holes. So that's Einstein's idea of gravity. Now Einstein added one more piece to, to, to this in his general theory of relativity. He asked the question of what happens if the, ma if the massive object isn't just sitting around, just sitting still? What if it's accelerating? What, what if it's oscillating or vibrating? What happens then? Well, then his picture was that space-time must ripple. Very much like if you threw a rock in the middle of a quiet pond, ripples spread out from the rock. Same thing happens if you take a, a massive object and you, uh, you accelerate it or bob it around. And that's what this next video shows. Space-time is this flat grid. If the star is oscillating up and down, you will see that this flat grid of space-time is actually forms ripples, and these ripples spread out and travel away from the source, just like the ripples on the surface of a pond would travel away after you drop the rock. 
And that was Einstein's picture of gravitational waves. These are ripples of the space-time itself. This is, of course, a very simplified picture because it's, it's a two-dimensional representation of a theory in, uh, uh, in, for, for, uh, which is actually four-dimensional because there's three dimensions of space and also a dimension of time. But this is a nice picture to carry. If you're wondering what a gravitational wave is, it's really just a ripple of space-time, and it behaves very much like you would think of other waves. They actually take carry away energy, and they have frequencies associated with them, or wavelengths, and all of those things, okay? All right, so if you wanted to do astrophysics with this gra these messengers of gravity, what must you know? You must know a few things about the properties of these, these lights, uh, of, these, of these waves, rather. So ordinarily, when we look out into the universe, we use light. That's what, we, uh, that, that's what I started my talk with, that beautiful uh, picture of uh, Cassiopeia, eh? And light is created when you accelerate charge. So if you just took an electron out of your pocket and you put it on a spring and you accelerate it, it will radiate electromagnetic waves, which is light. Now, very much in the same way, in a, in a loose analogy, gravitational waves are irradiated when you accelerate mass. Okay, so that's the first thing you want to know. Now, it turns out that char uh, charges are pretty light. And as a result, you can accelerate them to very, very high uh, frequencies. And as a result, you can have objects that have, you know, that wig cause light waves with, uh, with very short wavelengths. And that allows us to form images or pretty pictures. So whenever you look out into the sky with light, the very first thing you do is you see some beautiful picture of an object. And then you dig deeper and you understand the, the, the physical processes going on. Now, it turns out with gravitational waves, if you're trying to oscillate a, 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 something that has the mass of a, of a sun or, or, or bigger, it doesn't want to wig, uh, oscillate very fast. So gravitational waves are intrinsically low frequency uh, waves, and in fact, their wavelengths are, 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 are very long. It can be, you know, uh, kilometers to hundreds of kilometers. And as a result, you don't really form these pretty images, but in fact, you form waveforms. And what are waveforms? Waveforms are a way of, of mapping the bumps and wiggles of the space-time itself as a function of frequency. And that's what that picture in the box shows. We call the amplitude of the gravitational wave a strain, and we'll come to why that's useful, as a function of time. And in fact, because some of the objects that we are looking for with our detectors here on the Earth oscillate at the frequencies that uh, belong in the human audio band, we encode them sometimes even into pretty sounds. So instead of pretty, you can think about it this way. With light telescopes, you make pretty pictures. With gravitational wave detectors, you can make pretty sounds. Now, there's a couple of things, if you're an astronomer, that are very important about gravitational waves versus light. Light, it turns out, is an extremely friendly creature. Every time a photon meets matter, it interacts with it. It gets absorbed, it gets scattered, it gets dispersed by matter. Gravitational waves, on the other, other hand, are extremely aloof. They, simply, they interact extremely weakly with matter. And as a result, if you're, a, if you're an astronomer, and you point your telescope at an object and you see the light from it, you have to work pretty hard to decide if the light has somehow been changed along the way because it met some other object as it was traveling from its original source. Gravitational waves, you don't have to worry about that at all. They pass through everything more or less unchanged, so you don't have to worry about what's between you and, and, and the source. Um, and the, the way to think about this, as a nice analogy if you want to carry it away, if you are light, you're like, it's like going to a party with an extrovert, and you're ready to go home. And you say, all right, let's go. And then your extrovert friend meets someone, chats a bit, meets someone else, chats a bit. It takes you an hour to get out of the party, and by the time you get out of the party, you might not even get out the front door. You might go through a side door or something else. Gravitational waves are exactly the opposite. They're like going to the same party with an introvert. You say, I'm ready to leave, and if you're lucky, they'll say goodbye and thank you to the host, and you're out the front door. Very little interaction. So that's the, the, the power of these, these, one of the powerful things about these objects is that they're, they're actually carry information without uh, much change from when they were generated at the source. Now, just as, as, uh, as a reminder, light waves, because the oscillations are pretty fast, those are happening at 100 megahertz or faster, so you know, and gravitational waves, because the oscillations can't be very fast, they're usually about 10 kilohertz or slower. Now, if you want to do gravitational wave astrophysics, how do you construct a source 
of gravitational waves? Well, the basic ingredients are you need lots of mass, and that's why you, we think usually of things like neutron stars and black holes, lots of mass comp compacted into small volume. And you also need rapid accelerations, which means you need the, the, these objects to be in orbit, or you need explosions or collisions. And so that sort of brings me to my starting point when I said we'd be sort of in the warped and violent part of the universe. So warped because you have a lot of, of gravitational uh, pull in those regions where you have neutron stars and black holes, and violent because they're usually doing something rather explosive or, uh, or uh, that involves a lot of acceleration. So, some sources are colliding neutron stars or black hole pairs. You take these you know, pairs of neutron stars or black holes, and as they orbit each other, they lose energy to gravitational waves, and eventually they get faster and faster onto each other and collide. You can also get gravitational waves from just neutron stars that just spin about their own axis. Uh, they, that, causes, that spinning causes them to become slightly football-shaped or have other deformations on them, and those can, be, those can generate gravitational waves. Supernovae, that's a, a very nice source of gravitational waves because, uh, of course, we know that this ma mass is being blown off. These ejecta are, are, are being accelerated to actually uh, you know, very high accelerations. And then it turns out there's a source that is futuristic because we, you know, the detectors are not yet good enough for it, but you can look back to the Big Bang itself. So now I want to remind you of that, of that um, um, property of gravitational waves that they're aloof. So when the universe was very young, right after the Big Bang, it was hot and dense, and it was so hot and dense that the light, the photons, didn't escape. They were trapped inside the, the hot, dense plasma. They were, the, they were the extrovert who couldn't get out of the party. And the universe had to expand and cool before uh, the photons could escape. And that happened when the universe was about 400,000 years old. So when we look back at the very beginning of the universe with light, our information comes from 400,000 years after the universe uh, was born in the Big Bang, as, as we think of it now. Gravitational waves, on the other hand, also present in the very early universe, but they've been streaming out to us right from the beginning, because they are not trapped by the, by the hot, dense plasma. So if you want to look out, to the very earliest moments after the Big Bang, light doesn't do it for you, and you have to have another messenger, and gravitational waves would be one such messenger. And then, of course, a source that we don't really, I can't say much about is that since we haven't really, this is only the very beginning of how we are uh, able to detect gravitational waves uh, from uh, you know, cosmic objects, there may be unknown worlds there that we would discover. So I, I, I won't speculate, but we expect that to be true. Here's a movie that shows this process. This is a simulation of two black holes that are orbiting each other, and eventually they'll collide and, and give off gravitational waves. These black holes are sitting in a, a star and gas and dust field, so they can, they can uh, orbit about each other, and you can see that orbit because of the way that they change the properties of the gas, dust, and light around them. And so the, the reason why these black holes are getting closer to each other is that they're radiating gravitational waves, the energy carried away by those gravitational waves comes from the orbit. And as a result, they, these, star, these black holes have to get closer and closer to each other until they finally collide and form one quiescent black hole. Notice the ring of light around the black hole. That actually is the bending of light. This is light that's actually directly behind the black hole that's being curved around it. So that's the process by which one can get gravitational radiation from a pair of black holes. They're in, in an orbit about each other. And typically, what we are able to observe is usually the, the very last uh, moments before they crash into each other. OK, now Einstein was very ambivalent about this whole thing. He formulated actually a, a very complete mathematical framework and theory uh, to describe gravity, and he did this between 1915 and 1918. His original uh, paper on general relativity actually had some mistakes, which he eventually uh, uh, corrected in a 1918 paper. And in 1918, Schwarzschild actually looked at Einstein's equations and said, look, sitting in here, sitting in the math, is a type of star that has so much mass and such a small volume that even light cannot escape their gravitational pull. And in those early years, those were called dark stars. The word black hole hadn't been coined as yet. 
And Einstein did not like these uh, dark stars uh, at all. And in fact, he actually vacillated uh, about whether gravitational waves even exist. And in 1937, he actually um, um, uh, submitted a retraction saying gra rotational waves don't exist. And then in the same year, he retracted the retraction. So he was actually you know, really pretty, uh, pretty torn about, uh, about whether they were there. And then after that, after that retraction of the, of the retraction, he never again published on gravitational waves to the end of his life. So he had this relationship with them. In his original 1918, uh, 16 paper rather, he actually dismissed them as saying, well, they're so incredibly weak that they have no practical purpose whatsoever, ever. So that was the dismissal. So he had a kind of an ambivalent relationship with them. Now, doubts and controversy actually, not just Einstein's, but the whole scientific communities started to subside off in the, in the late 1950s and, um, and later. But this is as an important lesson in, in this little story, which is in the end, none of this matters unless you can ask, is this what nature does? You know, so experiment and observation have the final say always. And so evidence started to mount slowly but surely over, over the last century. So neutron stars were first proposed in 1934, as a, again, as a theoretical object, as the end product of an ordinary star as it collapses. Rotating neutron stars, were, which are called pulsars, were proposed in 1967, and they were first observed in that same year. The first black holes weren't observed until 1971, and in fact, those first black holes also um, had a lot of debate around them. And in fact, there was a famous debate between um, Stephen Hawking and Kip Thorne that wasn't resolved until 1990, and the, the debate was, the, the, the bet was, is this object, which was called Cygnus X1, the first black hole uh, um, uh, discovered, was it even a black hole? And so the debate raged. We didn't really have a definitive story about black holes. Now, in 1974, Hulse and Taylor Two, uh, two astronomers found a pulsar that was part of a binary system. A pulsar is a neutron star, but it's a kind of slightly special neutron star in that because of the very strong magnetic fields of, of, the, uh, of, of pulsars, the light that they emit is not isotropic. So if you look at our sun, any side you look at it from, it's emitting light. Pulsars don't do that. Pulsars have very beamed light, so they're like lighthouses. They're spinning about their own axis, and every, every time the pulsar beam comes across your line of sight, you can register a, a light pulse. And that's how they discovered the system, Hulse and Taylor, and they found, in fact, that it was part of a binary. It had another companion neutron star, and what they did was they measured, so here's the data, they measured, look at this, this plot. This plot goes from 1974 when the system was first observed, and it's, it's gone out to 2005. And on the vertical axis, what it is is just the, 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 the size of the orbit. So here is a pair of neutron stars that's orbiting each other. And indeed, if they, they should be, the orbit should be shrinking. They should be getting closer to each other as the, um, as they emit gravitational waves. And as they get closer to each, each other, the, the period uh, should be shrinking. It, it takes less time for them to orbit each other. And that's what the data shows. That's the, the, the dots. The data points show that, in fact, the orbit does decay. They are getting closer to each other. And then the solid line in that, in that curve is one of, the mo one of the great triumphs of observational um, you know, astronomy, as, which is that they measured all the parameters of this binary neutron star system. And then they asked general relativity, is this the right answer for the rate at which the orbit should shrink if it's gravitational waves? And the answer was exactly yes. You can see that the line lies on the dot. So this was considered a, a, a great triumph of, uh, and, and, and the first sort of indirect evidence for uh, gravitational waves, and it earned them the Nobel Prize in 1993. So now we have this, this, this mounting evidence. Now, Einstein's ambivalence was justified. The first observational evidence for neutron stars and black holes did not come in his lifetime. He died in 1955, and those things started to happen in the late 60s and early 70s. But the, one of the most remarkable things about him and his theory in general relativity theory is that general relativity made 
theory made very firm predictions about gravity, space time, and black holes. So he didn't like black holes. He, it's not clear what he thought of gravitational waves, but what was inescapable was that his theory could predict them pretty well, okay? And so here's a movie in which I show you two black holes, and you can see that they're orbiting each other, and at the bottom you'll see a waveform that's basically the, the way that space-time distorts as a function of time as these two black holes orbit each other and get closer and closer to each other. The blue parts of the plane are just are sort of flat space-time, and the greener and yellower parts are where space-time is very, very curved by the black holes. And what you see is that as the black holes orbit and lose energy and get closer to each other, the gravitational, their gravitational pull gets stronger and the space-time around them gets more warped. And in fact, the movie will freeze at the moment that the horizons, the, the, the putative edges of these two black holes will touch. And that's where we get the, the largest amplitude of the wave. If you look at the waveform at the bottom, there it is. You can see space-time is horribly distorted. And then these two black holes form into one larger black hole and the whole system sort of just kind of wobbles a little and then becomes quiescent. And that's the process by which, uh, which uh, these gravitational waves are, are generated and then they travel off into the distant universe. Okay? And this simulation is also a, an, 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 a solution of Einstein's field equations for a pair of black holes that are merging. Now, listen to the sound. Okay, that is the sound of two neutron stars or black holes colliding. So all that that sound is, is we take a waveform like the one that's shown here uh, and, and we encode it onto a loudspeaker. We might do some filtering to get it in the right, into the right uh, uh, a frequency band for that, that's pleasing to our ears, but that's called a chirp. It starts off with a kind of a hum. These two stars are far apart and they're just orbiting. And then as they get closer and closer, the hum gets louder and the pitch gets faster. They're going, they're, the uh, frequency increases because they're going faster around each other until they collide when, when you get the pop, right? So that's called a chirp. And this was the, the sort of, now, in the, in the mid-60s and early 70s, there was a, bit, a great deal of activity around this idea because neutron stars had, uh, bi binary neutron stars had been observed, Halston-Taylor system was there, uh, black holes had been observed, and so Professor Kip Thorne at Caltech was one of the people who was sort of leading the effort to understand theoretically, how you could use Einstein's theory to predict these waveforms. You know, what would the signal from such systems look like? Because this was, this was the work that he was doing uh, back, uh, back then and has done ever since. Now, let me just do a quick recap of gravitational waves so we, can, we know what we need to get to the next part, which is how do we detect them? All right, so we know they're predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. They are ripples of space-time, and what they do is they stretch and compress the space-time itself. Now, what does that mean? That simply means that if a gravitational wave goes through some region of space, it makes that region of space stretch and shrink, like so. Now, the change in distance that these gravitational waves cause by the stretching and shrinking of space is proportional to the amplitude of the wave, which we call h, and it's also proportional to the size of the space-time region. So here's a way to think about this. Oh my, okay. Imagine you have a region of, uh, you have a, a, a ring of particles on a circle of radius with uh, L. If a gravitational wave comes through, it will cause that circle to become an ellipse, and the amount by which it stretches the, the circle in one direction and shrinks it in the other is an amount delta L. Delta L is proportional to the original distance L and the amplitude of the wave. Now, one of the things that, that uh, was also came out of the, the work of, of, uh, of Kip Thorne and others was you could, you could actually put an amplitude on this wave. If you take a pair of neutron stars and they're orbiting each other to, at the very end of their orbit before they collide and you put it in a galaxy not too far from our own, they would have an amplitude of 10 to the minus 21. So, now we're armed with some numbers that, are, that actually are going to make us feel a bit depressed. So you have, this, you have the, the amount by which a space-time region changes. If it has length L, it will it will, it will, you'll see changes of delta L proportional to H times L. So here's the, the numbers now. 
the amplitude of the wave is 10 to the minus 21. Imagine that wave went through me. I'm an object of order a meter. Then my dimensions would change by 10 to the minus 21 meters. It's an awfully small number. It's actually so small that it's, it's almost laughable, right? It's uh, it, meters. I mean, so let me put a scale on that. If you had an, an atom, an atom has about the size of 10 to the minus 10 meters. If you look at the nucleus of the atom, it's, it's 100,000 times smaller. It has a size of about 10 to the minus 15 meters. And this amount by which I would be changing as this gravitational wave went through me is a million times smaller than the nucleus of an atom. So you, pretty absurd. OK, so that doesn't mean we shouldn't try to detect these gravitational waves, and so we do. So let's think a little bit about how one might measure gravitational waves. Now, there's a property of gravitational waves that I, I, I told you, which is that as they go through a region of space time, they shrink and stretch the space time. So here is a simple con a concept for how you might do it. Imagine you had a laser, and some distance away from that laser, you had a mirror. And it's a good mirror. It reflects the laser ba light back at you. And you had a good clock then all you do is you measure how long it took the light to travel to the laser and back, to, to the mirror, sorry, and back to you. If a gravitational wave went through that region of space time, that distance would change, the light travel time would change, and your clock would re register a slightly different time. Done. That's the concept, that's the principle of the measurement. Now it turns out for even reasonably long distances between the laser and the mirror, we do not have clocks that are good enough to make this measurement. The clocks are just not precise enough by several orders of magnitude. So even though the idea is, 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 is simple and sound, it doesn't work practically. So in practicality, what we do is we build an interferometer instead. So you take the same laser, but now instead of, of shining it at a single mirror, you split the laser beam into two parts. One goes north-south and the other one goes east-west and reflects off of two mirrors. Those light beams come back to the object in the center, which is a beam splitter, and you can measure the interference. If a gravitational wave comes through that region of space time, one arm of the interferometer will get longer, the other one will get shorter, and the light will travel at different, uh, 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 will take different amounts of time to travel through. Now, why is this measurement so much better than just using a clock? Well, it's, a, it's, an, it's an important principle in measurement. If you're using a clock, you need a clock that's absolutely good. Whereas here, this is a relative measurement. We can think of it as using one arm of the interferometer as a reference for the other arm. Then your clock doesn't have to be uh, have as, as, as good of precision. So that's good. That's the principle. Now, what do you need to do? Well, you need to make mirrors that are very, very still. Remember, the gravitational wave is going to change those space-time distances by a ridiculously small amount. Everything else on the planet wants to move the mirrors by more than the gravitational wave does. So that's the first thing you have to do. The second thing is, so you have to do a lot of vibration isolation and thermal control. Now imagine that you did that, and you did that really well. That doesn't help you very much if you can't measure small distances. And that's where the laser light comes in. That's our meter stick. So the laser light is the way that we probe the mirror positions. That's what's telling us where the mirror is relative to, uh, to the laser and relative to the other mirrors. Okay. Now, this is Professor Ray Weiss. And he was the, one of the other heroes of, of the story of LIGO. He was the first person to think about a practical way to use these interferometers to, uh, to observe gravitational waves. And this was, this, he was at MIT, and this was again in the late 60s and early 70s. It was a very vibrant time for this because of the discovery of black holes and pulsars and binary neutron stars and, and so on. So what he did was he, he was at the time actually an atomic physicist. And in 1960, the laser had just been invented. So he knew lasers. He actually liked them. He worked with them. And then he had this other idea, which is, well, if you're stuck on you know, the change in length delta L being the amplitude of the wave, which is given by nature, and the length of your, of your detector, then let's just make it long. How long could you make it? Well, he came up with the idea of making it four kilometers long, so 4,000 meters. And that's a nice number, because that's kind of the longest uh, path on the Earth where a laser beam can travel in a straight line before you actually have to tunnel because of the curvature of the Earth. So that was the, that was the number he came up with. And then if you make it long enough, then instead of having to measure this you know, 
10 to the minus 21 meters over my distance, you, are, you have to make a measurement of 10 to the minus 18 meters. So that's only a thousand times smaller than a proton. And he looked at that and he said, hmm, not so bad, we'll try it. Okay, so that's how this thing was born. He wrote up the complete theory for how, uh, com the complete design for how this could be done uh, in, in between 1968 and 1972. Okay? Um, and that, there was born a very bold experiment. That's the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO. LIGO comprises two detectors. There's one in Louisiana and one in Washington State. They're L-shaped and they're four kilometers long, as, as Weiss originally had proposed. And they're capable of measuring changes in, in mirror separation at the level of 10 to the minus 18 and eventually 10 to the minus 19 meters. Okay, so that's what they are. Uh, a quick tour, here's a LIGO uh, uh, um, detector. This is the one in Louisiana. You can tell because it's in this, in this, in this leafy green um, uh, forest. And you, they, uh, in the center you have this, the corner station of where the laser lives. And then the going out in, in, you know, for four kilometers in an L shape are uh, two beam tubes along which the laser light runs and reflects off of mirrors at the end and comes back. Here is what the, the beam tube itself looks like. So you can see that it's, a, it's pretty big. It's a stainless steel tube about 1.2 meters in diameter running for four kilometers. And it's covered by, this, uh, by a, a concrete housing. And that concrete housing actually has had some utility. Um, so here what, what happened was this is now at our Washington Observatory and this patrol car came flying over the dune and didn't notice that there was this four kilometer long barrier in the middle of the desert. So, um, you know, that was, you know, the, the driver I think had, had a broken rib, but there was not much more damage than that. Um, then if you go into the observatory, into say the central uh, station where the laser is, you'll see objects like these. These are vacuum chambers. Every one of these holds about one mirror of the interferometer. And they're pretty big. If I were to stand beside one of these, the top of my head would be just under that lowest row of viewports, so the little round circles uh, at, uh, uh, over there. So why so big? Well, every mirror of the interferometer has to sit on a lot of vibration isolation. And the vibration isolation systems look like objects like this. So this, you can see the, 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 uh, the copper colored uh, objects are springs and the springs are, are loaded down by masses, which is the stainless steel cylinders. And this is, should remind you of things like shock, uh, shock absorbers in your car. So this is, a, this is passive isolation where you simply rely on the properties of a spring mass system to give you isolation from, from uh, the motion that drives it. And then you can also have active isolation systems where you measure the motion and you cancel it out. Now each mirror of the interferometer looks like something like this. So the very bottom is a nice beautiful glass object. It's about 35 centimeters in diameter, so quite big. It weighs 40 kilograms. And this mirror is hanging as a pendulum. Now it turns out that pendulums are pretty nice filters for motion. If you take a pendulum and, and you, and you uh, move it's the point where the string attaches and you look at what the plumb bob is doing, at very low frequencies, when you move the string, the plumb bob will just go with it. It's like a, it's like a rigid body, they're attached. Above the natural frequency of the pendulum, if you move the, the, the string very fast, the plumb bob at the bottom will move hardly at all. And that's a nice way for filtering because you can have a lot of motion here, but your mirror at the bottom doesn't move very much. And so that's, and in this case, it's, these mirrors are actually hanging not just from one pendulum, but from four layers of pendulums. So if you go from the bottom mirror to the, the, the object above it, that's the, another stage of pendulum. Then you have this flat steel uh, uh, object that's another stage of pendulum. And finally, you have the flexures on the top, which is another stage of pendulum. And every stage gives you more and more filtering of this motion. So that's how we do the vibration isolation. A, that's the laser. It's a, the LIGO uses a pretty, a pretty powerful laser. It's a 200 watt laser. It's an inf, a near infrared laser. Um, and to just give you a comparison, if you take a typical laser pointer like the ones that in, in, in these uh, uh, gizmos, they should emit about a milliwatt. So when you have a 200 watt laser, that's a lot of laser power. Okay? And this is the control room from which the whole experiment gets, uh, gets uh, uh, controlled. Now. The sensitivity of LIGO is, is measured in, 
in plots like these. On, the, on this uh, plot, in the horizontal axis, you see frequency. And notice something very important about the frequency. It goes from 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz, which is kind of the human audio band. And so these instruments are most sensitive it's at the same frequencies that, that our ears work. Now, they weren't designed because we want to hear things. They were designed because it turns out that that's the frequencies at which we can detect colliding neutron stars and black holes. So, so that's the, and these curves over here, LIGO was built in phases. The red curve is the design sensitivity of the first phase of LIGO. It's, it's the curve that, that Ray Weiss had, had proposed back in 1972, very close to that. And then the blue curve and the green curve are the sensitivity of LIGO in 2007 and in 2010. Now, with that first phase of LIGO, we didn't see anything. We looked out into the sky, and we saw no signals that correspond to cosmic objects. And that drove us to design and build a next phase of LIGO called advanced LIGO, and that's given by this black curve here. And so in this black curve is basically the target sensitivity of this second phase of LIGO, which we call advanced LIGO. And to go from the, the original initial LIGO to the advanced LIGO curve, we essentially had to do better seismic isolation at those very low frequencies where the vibrations of the Earth were bothering us. So that's where, where the improvements there were, were, were gained. Now at intermediate frequencies in the region between sort of 50 and 150 hertz, we had to use better materials because we were limited by the thermal vibrations of, of the, the mirrors and the wires from which they were hanging. And then finally, at the highest frequencies, we had to use more laser power. And the, when you increase the laser power, you actually can improve the sensitivity of the measurement. And so that's how those, those, those things were, were, were done. Now, I just want to remind everybody that Weiss uh, calculated this red curve back in 72, and notice when, it, when we actually achieved that curve, the, I'm sorry, the red curve in, in 1972, and we achieved those curves in 2007 and then a little bit better in 2010. So this has been a very long process, okay? Now, why do we want these curves to do this, to get better? Every time you make the curve lower, you've done a better, you, you've, you've got a more sensitive instrument. The reason is, it's just like if your telescope improves. Now, most of you will recognize that this, is, this blobby looking object is Saturn. Now, if you get a better telescope, you might see Saturn like this. Now, if you get a telescope that flies by Saturn on a satellite, you would see this. And that's really the game we're playing here, too. We're simply just making our, our, sen our instruments more and more sensitive, okay? Now, LIGO is not the only gravitational wave detectors we have. We all have a global network of detectors. There's two in the US, which I've already pointed to you, which are in Washington State and Louisiana. They're four kilometers long. Then there's also a, a, a detector in Italy, which is a French-Italian uh, collaboration. It's a three kilometer long detector called Virgo. Uh, there's a, a 600 meter long detector in Germany, a British-German collaboration. And then in Japan, under construction, not yet operational, is Kagura, three kilometers long. And recently approved is a, uh, is a proposal to put a, a LIGO, four kilometer long LIGO detector in India. And then finally, there's also proposals to have satellite-based space detectors, and that's called LISA, which is the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. And LISA can have arm lengths that are five million kilometers long. So because I mean, real estate in space is abundant and cheap. So now we come to the event that we detected. So I've told you what gravitational waves are. I've told you how we can go about measuring them with interferometers but that have lots of good vibration isolation and, and, and other important things. And now I want to tell you what happened on September 14, 2015. The advanced LIGO detectors, both the ones in, in Louisiana and Washington, were on the air. And they each registered a signal. And it turned out to be on a, a signal from a binary uh, a black hole collision. So here's what happened. So here's an animation. Here's the two black holes. They're orbiting each other. And they collided, and gravitational waves were emitted. And those gravitational waves made a long journey across the universe and eventually passed through our very own planet Earth. And as they came through the Earth, they caused 
small vibrations. Now you'll see the Earth jiggling like jello here, but please pay attention. This is an effect that's greatly, greatly, greatly exaggerated. The waves hit our Louisiana Observatory first. They were coming from the south. And then seven milliseconds later, they, we detected it in Washington. So the waves came from the south, deposited teeny tiny amount of energy into the interferometer, uh, into the detector, and we detected that in Louisiana, uh, seven milliseconds later in Washington. And that signal was detected using the interferometer. And so here you see the, a little simulation of how that was done. This is a laser light, and the laser light uh, at the detector itself becomes brighter or darker depending on the relative lengths of the two paths that the laser light takes. And that's simply because it's a question of whether the peaks of the, uh, uh, and troughs of the, of the two li uh, light beams line up with each other or they don't. Then you get either constructive or destructive interference. And that was how the signal was detected as brighter or dimmer. So that's the, the, the principle by which the gravitational wave signal is, is converted to an optical signal. All right. And this is what the signal looked like. These two signals have been, so the, 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 the Washington, which is called the Hanford data, signal was time shifted by seven milliseconds, 6.9 milliseconds to be precise, so that they line up with each other. Both detectors saw the signals. And you can see that it actually has some of the properties that, that I have described in the waveforms before. The maximum amplitude of the signal, the strain or the amplitude of the wave, was 10 to the minus 21. And that corresponds to a change in distance or displacement of our mirrors of about four atometers, or four times 10 to the minus 18 meters, okay? This is what it sounds like if we encode it into sound. That's, that's the original sound, and that's just sped up by a factor of two so our ears can register it better. And what you can see is it's, it's, a, it's a classic chirp. Starts at low frequency, low amplitude. Frequency grows, amplitude glows, grows, and then when the two, two objects collide, you, you hear a thud or a thump or, 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 or a, a clap. And so that was what, was, what, what uh, those signals looked like. Now, what does this signal tell us about the source? Well, here is the, the actual reconstruction of the signal. And from the frequency and the way the frequency changes as a function of time, we can extract the masses of the two objects that were, were, uh, were orbiting each other. From the amplitude and the way that the amplitude evolves, we can actually extract how far the, 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 the objects were, and we can also extract the inclination angle. That simply means the plane of the orbit. Was it along our line of sight or directly normal or something in between? And then. At the very end, where you see the signal sort of uh, decay, from that last part of the waveform, uh, from the frequency and the time it takes for it to decay, we can tell what the mass and spin of the final black hole was. So there's a lot of information encoded in, in, these, in these waveforms. And remarkably, all of that information is embedded there by Einstein's field equations. It's all there in, in the theory. So now we are ready to reveal the story uh, of, the, of the two black holes that, that were observed. Once upon a time, 1.3 billion years ago, there were two black holes. They were rather big black holes. Actually, what we learned was they were about 30 times more massive than our own sun, which was a bit of a surprise. We didn't expect this class of stellar mass black holes to be that heavy. And in fact, we don't really know how nature might form them. The two black holes danced in orbit about each other, and they emitted gravitational waves exactly as Einstein ins instructed them to. This made them get ever closer to each other and orbit ever faster. And at the moment that they collided, they were actually moving at about half the speed of light. So you've got to wrap your head around this. These are objects that are 30 times more massive than our sun. They're about 150 kilometers apart and they're whipping about each other at half the speed of light. So it's an extremely relativistic system. The black holes merged, and they formed a bigger black hole. And of course, they gave off the spectacular storm of gravitational waves, which we recorded 1.3 billion years later in our detector. Now, the newly formed black hole was not as massive as its parents. The newly formed black hole was missing three solar masses of 
of mass or energy. And this tells us that three times the mass of our sun was converted into gravitational wave energy. Now, what that translates into is that for that brief instant, for, for those few hundred milliseconds, as these two black holes were colliding, more energy was released than all the shining stars emit in the universe. So it's a very, very energetic uh, explosion or collision, if you will. Now, even though it was so energetic, the measurement we made was an atometer. It was a few atometers. And that's the, the amazing thing that all this energy is given off, but very little of it deposits in our detector. They did not live happily ever after. We learned that too. But I do want to point out something, that the two parent black holes died, but a new black hole was formed. They gave birth to a, a, a bigger uh, black hole, and so the cycle of, of, of black hole life continues. OK, now why all the excitement? So I'm going to sort of wrap up and try to give you some perspective on why has this been, why was all those headlines around. So the, the first thing was, this was the first di direct det detection of gravitational waves. Einstein predicted them 100 years earlier. There were, you know, he himself was unsure whether they are, they were not. Here we were directly seeing the ripples of space-time. This is also the first direct observation of a binary black hole system. We've never seen black holes crash into each other like this before, and we saw this in real time. Those bumps and wiggles in our signal were the motion of two black holes colliding. This is also the first test of Einstein's general relativity theory in the strong field limit. Now, what does that mean? Strong field just simply means in regions of space where gravity is very strong. Why is that important? So black holes would be such a space. Why is that so important? Let me remind you of Newton's theory of gravity. There were, Newton's theory was extremely successful, but it had a failure that was known, you know, quite quickly uh, and, a few, you know, quite a while before Einstein came along. Newton's theory could not correctly uh, explain the orbit of Mercury, the planet Mercury. What's special about Mercury? It's closest to the sun, so it feels it's in a region of, of, of space-time in our own solar system where gravity is the strongest. And Newton's theory was failing there. And it was one of the early triumphs of general relativity was that Einstein explained the orbit of Mercury. So there's no reason for us to believe that general relativity theory is the correct theory when gravity gets very strong. We've never been able to test that before. We were with this observation, and so far, so good. It's working. And then finally, for me personally, as someone who's really worked all of my career on uh, the, the uh, gr gravitational wave instruments themselves, the machine works, and it works with atometer precision. So this is another amazing thing about precision measurement. So that's all the, why it was all so exciting. But the real excitement is that we have never before looked out into the universe and seen the universe with gravitational waves. And so it's inevitable that we're going to see new things. Every time we've turned on a new type of sense, whether it's a new color of light looking at, uh, out into the universe, we've discovered things we didn't know were there. And that's sure to happen here, too, in, 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 in time. OK, now this didn't just excite um, you know, scientists, it also had some, some effect in, uh, in, the, in the mainstream. So this is a photograph that was taken in a New York City subway in March, so shortly after the announcement. And it claims that it's easier to detect gravitational waves than to find an apartment in New York City with a good closet. Now, I might argue with that, but you know, New Yorkers m maybe would argue back, okay? <laughs> but it was kind of remarkable to see something like this. It has sort of touched you know, mainstream society and culture as well. So what's next? Well, we're work working on improving the advanced LIGO detectors and walk walking our way down towards the final design sensitivity and beyond. And that's what those curves show. The green curve shows what we had going in 2010. The red curve shows what the sensitivity of the instruments during this observing run in, in 2015 when we made the first detection. The blue curve shows where we're heading. That's the ultimate design sensitivity of advanced LIGO. And then the cyan curve shows that we're already thinking of ideas to do better than that sensitivity. We're also waiting for these partner observatories of the global network to come on the air. And that surely, we hope, will give us more sources, new sources, unknown sources to detect. So I'm going to leave you with this one final thought. 400 years ago, Galileo 
pointed the first telescope into the sky. It was a one and a half inch mirror, uh, d a diameter uh, refractor. And he, he observed that the moon has craters and mountains. He observed the phases of Venus. He observed the, the, the rings of Saturn. And it took us almost 300 years to go from the, those early one inch telescopes to a 100 inch telescope. So there's Mount Wilson 100 inch telescope. It took another 100 years to put a 100 inch telescope into space. And now we are building these 25 meter class telescopes here on the Earth. At the same time as this was going on, we also learned to, to look out into the sky with colors of light that we ourselves can't see. We've put out infrared telescopes, we've put out gamma ray telescopes, we've put out X-ray telescopes, we've put out radio telescopes. And all of those things have revealed to us uh, you know, all that our universe is made of. And the gravitational wave sky is the same. The gravitational waves span the same 20 orders of magnitude in frequency or wavelength, whichever you like to think about. And we've just touched the very first observations with the terrestrial detectors, which are the fastest systems, these neutron stars or black holes that are, are whipping about each other and colliding. In time, we should see supernovae this way. If you go to, and those are happening sort of in the 100 hertz region, that's where the best sensitivity are. In sort of the millihertz region, you can think about space detectors like LISA, and those will observe different kinds of objects. Those will observe supermassive black holes that are, uh, are at the centers of galaxies, for example. If you get to the nanohertz region, you start to, you can use pulsar timing arrays to observe gravitational waves in those frequency range. And then if you get to the time scale of the age of the universe, you can actually observe gravitational waves with these extremely long wavelengths by measuring the polarization of the cosmic microwave background. And these are all techniques that are about to explode. You know, we've started off with the terrestrial detectors. In the next 20 years, these methods will all start filling our information about what the gravitational wave sky looks like. So I hope you're excited, because this is a very exciting time. Thank you.